Um, so it's, it's me and Sarah are going to share little bits of what we know about these plays, enough to get, we hope, to get the discussions going and see just how far we can explore um, each one each evening. So we'll do a different play each evening, but that's the idea. We're going to start with Tempest because it's the first play in the Shakespeare Folio, even though traditionally it's called the last play, Shakespeare last play. And there is, I know, there is a profound reason for doing it like that. The thing about The Tempest is fantastic, really. It's, it's a play that like, encapsulates everything you find in little, little parts of in, in most of the other plays, especially the comedies. Um, but The Tempest encapsulates the whole lot in one go. And I believe it, it shows somebody uh, who's a real initiate trying to become an adept, about to become an adept. Um, or maybe as an adept already to start with. It all depends how the directors interpret it and produce it. Sometimes they may prosper out to be a bit of a fool and, um, and not a very nice person, but that's not what the words say in, in the play. And there's a whole depth to it that is often missed um, because The Tempest, like most of the other comedies and some of the um, tragedies too, are really based on the mystery traditions. So they, they use various mystery stories as the background uh, for the whole story of the play itself. And, um, and The Tempest is, is uh, I think, the greatest of them all, really, because it sums it all up. And so like any good book, and also in architecture, I as an architect, um, you have to make the cover give an idea of everything you're going to find within the book. And you do that with architecture, with the sacred building, the, the entrance, give you an idea of what you're going to find inside. Usually symbolically, shows it symbolically, but you can read it like a book. And you say, oh, yes, I want to go in, I want to explore further, and then you go in. Um, so I think the Tempest acts like that for the whole Shakespeare folio. Um, and I find, that for me, it's, I find the play very moving when it's done well. And I thought the last production. It's still going on. It's particularly good in that way because it shows the magic. So what I thought I'd go through is um, some of the background behind the Tempest where it is using certain wisdom traditions, definite wisdom traditions, and show you what Prospero and the other characters are. Well, Prospero mainly I'm going to talk about um, what, what he's based on as, as a character and uh, what the author was trying to um, show and question and, and, and um, show the difficulty. I mean, I mean, I always find there's lots of arguments come up, which maybe we can discuss about, um, with The Tempest, where most people um, get very attuned to Caliban. They love Caliban and they think, oh, Prospero's really mistreated Caliban and so on. Well, maybe or maybe not. Um, and then you've got the, the men who arrive on the island and it doesn't seem to be that they have a very nice time and it seems to be Prospero who is causing it. Um, and then you've got Ferdinand and Miranda and um, can Ferdinand be tested very much? Well, just imagine, you know, I put myself in a position, just imagine you are Prospero, you've raised your daughter from a tiny tot um, up to this woman who's now, now maturing sexually and so on. And, um, and suddenly, on the island, arrives uh, six, six men, um, three of whom have been trying to kill you, and will kill you again if they could. And then you've got Caliban, who's tried to rape your daughter. So what do you do with somebody who's tried to raise, help and educate her, right, and then tries to rape your daughter? What do you do? You're alone with your daughter on this island with this Caliban creature, what what would you do to stop him, you know, trying to carry out his rope? Um, and then, and then you got some of the men are, are drunkards. They get drunk, and they, um, in alliance with Caliban, they become potential killers too. So you've got actually six killers, six potential killers on the island, out to kill Prospero and rape your daughter. 
What do you do? You know, and I think often that's not taken on board properly in some of these directions. You know, it, it's a big, big question. You shouldn't even think about that. Um, I know, you know, at the start, it's, it starts off, you know, um, Prospero has created the storm in order to bring the ship to land. And um, so you could say he's, he's set the whole thing up to start with, which he, which he has. But how's he going to deal with it? How's he going to deal with it safely? And, um, and it's, it's very moving when uh, his, his daughter challenges, challenges him. You know, he says, um, no, no harm is done. I wish nobody any harm. No harm is done. And no harm was done at all through the whole story. Um, so he's not out for revenge. He's out to make things better than it was before. I think that's a key to the play. And it's a key to, to all the comedies, really. Um, they, they, they're all studies in love and how, how to um, express that love, how to use that love in any situation, easy situations or very difficult and challenging situations like uh, Prospero's God. How, how do you act in a, in a loving, caring way? Uh, to bring about the best for everybody. And I, I know from the wisdom traditions and what um, Jesus taught and so on that love, love is the great law of life and is the wisdom. Love is wisdom. It is the pure wisdom. But the difficulty is for us to work, have, work out how to express it in, in the wise way it is meant to be expressed in any situation. And for me, the Shakespeare plays go through all this. Um, the, all the different aspects, throwing up the difficulties, the challenges, and, and how, how you can express that love, or do the opposite. You know, the tragedy is about the opposite of that love, where people are not loving, and the challenges come up, or they set up the challenges, and they go down, 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 down in evolution, whereas the comedies are raising people up all the time. Um, and the histories are kind of... Well, the histories of histories. <laughs> but they're, they're a great study in the human psyche too. And one or two of them are mystery stories as well. Maybe they all are, but I've only recognised a few of them as mystery stories. Um, you, know, you, you probably all know the name, where the name mystery comes from, but I'll, I'll recap anyway. Mystery comes from the Greek word mysteria. And it referred to those dramas that were put on in the schools of wisdom, and usually performed by initiates and the candidates for initiation. And they, the stories were all allegories, and there are some, some historical things in it as well, but they're basically allegories about life itself, in which it's possible to discover the fundamental laws of life and learn how to um, understand them and work with them, so that you become a better and better person in that way. So they're all stories of initiation, the, the dramas, initiation into the mystery of life itself, the mystery of, of love, basically. Um, and they started in, in the wisdom schools or mystery schools, and then gradually came out more and more into the public theatre. And that's what we've inherited. We've inherited that, that wonderful drama from the mysteries. And now, now and again, we get a wonderful author who will be able to create, you know, write a drama as a mystery. I think there's some, a few modern ones, modern people can, can do that, especially in film, the film industry. But the one we're looking at is Shakespeare, who's still the, to my, my mind and many people's mind, still the greatest. He hasn't been surpassed yet um, in his ability to do this. Um, so the mystery, if it's a good mystery, it will show the initiatory path that leads eventually to illumination, to the full expression of love, which is wisdom, which illumines our mind and soul, and we know it because we're practicing it. We put, it, put what we understand of it into action, and then we, then we get to know it, and that's called illumination or revelation, which is a state of love and peace and joy. It's what what peace really means. We wish everybody to rest in peace. Like peace is that originally meant that that state of illumination, 
Uh, well, what I've identified in the temple is um, quite a few mystery traditions that, that the play is based on, and they and the, the, the author has kind of fused fused these traditions together in a beautiful way. So, ones I've recognised are the Atlantean mysteries, the Arthurian and Druidic mysteries, the Dionysian and Orphic mysteries, the Christian mysteries, and the Hermetic mysteries. So what I thought I'd try and do in this, this short presentation is just uh, pick out certain bits of these to, to help, help us see what's going on. So I'm going to start with the Atlantean mysteries. Well, of course, the, the, the central thing about the Atlantean mysteries is Atlantis. The island of Atlantis were originally, in the, in the Plato story, originally consisted of ten islands, ten sacred islands known as Ogygia, or Ogygia, depends how you pronounce it. Um, and they were all filled with orchards of green trees laden with apples. And one of these orchards was known as the Garden of the Hesperides. And that was the sort of central key one out, out of all of them. It's these ten sacred islands. And that immediately links you with the whole, what's come through the Hebrew and Jewish tradition with the Jewish Kabbalah and Tree of Life, with the ten Sephiroth, the Tree of Life, and so on. Um, but other, other cultures had the same wisdom, knowledge. Um, and then the king of Atlantis, we all know, was called Atlas. And in the Bible, he's referred to as Enoch. Um, Atlas, the king of Atlantis. His title was the Phoenix King. He traditionally is the most ancient, original Phoenix King. The idea of the Phoenix was applied to him. So it's interesting, in, in Act 3 of the Tempest, you've got Sebastian. Sebastian's quite... You know, he's, he's one of the characters he really perceives quite well. And he's, he says, now I will believe that there are unicorns, that in Arabia there is one tree, the phoenix throne, one phoenix at this hour reigning there. So he's, he makes this remark about the island and what's going on and so on. You know, he suddenly realised, this is like Atlantis. There's a king here who's the phoenix king, who reigning over here. Now, that, to, to the Jews or the Hebrews, the Atlas was Enoch, and he was known as the first human soul to reach the highest level of initiation and to become one with the spirit of the Messiah. Um, and then, he, out of his love, he said, sort of going entirely into the whole bosom of divine love, he chose out of his love to keep returning to this world um, until every single human soul was raised up to that very, very high level of, of, the, of the Messiah, or Christ level. And that, that's in the Jewish tradition, the Hebrew tradition, which I, be, I believe in very much. Um, so, talking about the Phoenix King is something quite, quite special. And so you've got an idea that Shakespeare is taking this up and, you know, a little hint, a little hint here about what, what Prospero not necessarily is, but what he's connected with, you know, and, um, and what's going on in this. It's to do with, very much to do with the mysteries at a very high level. And then in the Arthurian and Druidic mysteries, um, it's very much mentioned in both of those mystery traditions about the Blessed Isles, the Isles of the West. Now, these are particularly associated with the British Isles. Of course, it's Arthurian Druidic history. So it's the British Isles. We're called the Br Blessed Isles, or Isles of the West. And when you look on a map, you can see they're, they're basically made up of three major lands, which nowadays we call Scotland, Ireland, and England and Wales, which was once Britannia, Roman Britain. They're three great lands, like a trinity. And right in the middle, as a, another little, a little island, small island, you've got the Isle of Man, like, like the heart centre of, 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 of the whole of the British Isles. Um, and the great god, the sea god, as he's called, of the Isle of Man, was um, a god called Mananan. Now Mananan, who's the god, or 
or spiritual king, if you like, of this blessed of the most blessed of all the blessed islands. Uh, he was an illusionist, a shapeshifter, a skilled sailor who could sail boats without sails or oars. Where did you hear that in the prosperous story? A creator of storms designed to wreck ships. Owner of a pack of hounds who chased boar into lakes. Now, boar in the, in the Druidic mysteries, the boar was, was the name um, and, or symbol given to every initiate who came and learned to be a Druid, that they were boars. And the Druids themselves called themselves boars. So, in other words, referring to candidates going through initiation and to be chased into the lakes means they're being chased into the waters of baptism to be purified. Um, and Mananam was a psychopomp who gives mortals a preview of the other world by conducting them there for a time. Doesn't this ring bells with the Tempest mm -hmm. and Prospero? So you see Prospero is being a little bit modelled on Mananam. And another name in the Druidic mysteries given to this blessed island was Avalon, which means the island of apples. Um, just like Eden, Eden had the apple tree as well as the uh, tree of life, the apple tree being the tree of knowledge. <coughs> so it's interesting, you've got Sebastian again in the Tempest, I think this is Act 2, yeah, Act 2, Scene 1. Sebastian says, <coughs> I think he will carry this island home in his pocket and give it to his son for an apple. That's a little hint. And Antonio replies, and sowing the kernels of it in the sea, bring forth more islands. So they got this hint of the island of apples, the Avalon. And Avalon is, is very well known as Merlin's Crystal Isle. It's the Isle of Merlin, this crystal isle, and in the isle is a cave. And in, in, the, in this tradition, it says that Merlin retired there with the nine orders of bards and the 13 treasures of Britain. One of those treasures being what we nowadays call the Holy Grail. That was the 13th of the treasures. Um, so he retires there into this island. But also, Arthur, when he is mortally wounded at his last battle, he's taken to Avalon as well, so this crystal island. And there he, he rests, um, neither dead or alive, it said waiting until the time when he's awoken and um, comes to help people again, rescue them. Um, well, also in the tradition, while, while he was there, he was taught, tested, and initiated by Merlin. So there's the reason for him being on the island. He's being taught, tested, and raised to a higher level of, of, of operation, really, of, of behavior. So here you've got the idea of Prosper again being modelled on Merlin as well, and Ferdinand um, relating to Arthur in this, in this symbolism. Then we got the Dionysian and Orphic mysteries. Um, Orpheus was the reformer of the Dionysian mysteries. He, he um, raised it to a higher level than it was before. Um, but it's the only mysteries that always claim that God or Eros is love. God is love, Eros is love. You know, that which we can name as God, the first manifestation of the unmanifest, is Eros, which is divine love. And that's in the Dionysian mysteries, reformed by Orpheus in, in the Orphic mysteries. And, um, and they were very important. They, they formed the main classical mysteries um, of both Greece and Rome. And Originally, the, the, the great they were founded in Thracia, which is now um, Bulgaria, ancient Thracia, in, in the mountains there. But then they spread into Greece when Greece was formed. And they, they, uh, the big centre there was at Eleusis in Athens. So they were called the Eleusin Mysteries. But then the Greeks spread um, westwards, and they took over Sicily and, and the southern part of, of Italy. And... Um, set up colonies there, and their main, their main colony there was, was set up at a place called Kumai, and that's where they anchored the, these mysteries, the Dionysian Orphic mysteries there. 
that we've transplanted into Italy. And, and th this, this is important in the, in the Tempest story, because the Tempest is ostensibly set um, in Italy and, and the sea just off, off its west coast. Um, now, Vir Virgil is the famous one for describing some of these mysteries. And he, he was an initiate of this mystery tradition of Cumae. And um, he wrote some of it, or a lot of it, in his Ennead, which describes the adventures of Ennead's Prince of Troy. And this provides a, a basic foundation for the play The Tempest, particularly books three and six. So just, just pick out a few bits of it. Book three describes the visit of Aeneas to the Isles of the Strophads, where the harpists snatch away the food. <laughs> and then it's also mentioned again in book six, to explain more that the banquet is actually part of the mysteries of initiation, from which are excluded all those who are at enmity with their brothers, have beaten a parent, or wrought deceit against a client. So that if there's anyone not fitting to take part in the banquet, the harpid or harpies appear and scare off um, those people in, in a certain way. Then book six particularly describes how Aeneas is driven by a storm onto the coast of Africa, where he meets and is entertained by Dido, the queen of Carthage. Dido falls in love with Aeneas and marries him. Aeneas, Aeneas, however, is commanded by the gods to leave Carthage with his followers and continue on to Italy to make his new settlement there. So he does this, and in his voyage from Carthage, Aeneas is driven by a second storm and shipwrecked upon the coast of Sicily. So all these storms come into this. And he's led from thence uh, to Cumae, where the Sibyl conducts him to the infernal regions so that he might hear from his father via the oracle concerning the fates that attended him and his posterity. Um, and as he is led through the tortuous underground passages and caverns, Aeneas undergoes drowsiness and perceives the shades of the dead. Now there's a, a link to this, well, well, one of the links to this in the, in the Tempest, again Sebastian, in Act 2, Scene 1, he says, what a strange drowsiness possesses them. It's the king and his brother and Prosper's brother are kind of going to sleep. And Ant Antonia says, it's, oh, it's the quality of the climate. Then Gonzalo, um, in, a, in a later act, Act 3, he says, by a lark, by a lakin, I can go no further, sir. My old bones ache. Here is a maze trod indeed through forthrights and meanders. By your patience I must needs rest me. So he's got tired and introduced the idea of the maze, which is exactly what's described in the underworld, that you have to go through an initiation. You have to find your way through the maze and out the other side. Then finally, the ass emerges into the sunshine in the midst of delightful meadows and happy people. And here he is granted celestial visions. Just like was conjured up by Prospero the third man in Miranda. Mm -hmm. Celestial visions of the gods and goddesses. What Prospero conjures up, of course, is celestial vision of three particular goddesses, all of whom are deeply connected with these mysteries. After this, Aeneas proceeds further north to the river Tiber, where Latinus, the king of the country, receives him with great hospitality. And Aeneas marries Latinus's daughter, Lavinia, and succeeds his father-in-law on the throne. And from them were descended the Romans. So you get, you get an impression of how this kind of underlies the whole plan of the story of the Tempest, really. And then the, the, the lo actual locations used by Shakespeare for, for this play are to do with Italy and also um, North Africa. Um, so Tunis, it starts, they're all associated with Aeneas and the story. So to take Tunis, Tunis was the capital of Tunisia. 
It replaced Carthage after the Arabs destroyed it in AD 698. Um, but its predecessor, Carthage, was located 10 miles northeast of Tunis. And that city was founded around about 853 BC um, under the name of Bursa, B-Y-R-S-A. That was its original name. It was founded by Phoenician colonists fleeing from Tyre, led by Alyssa, the daughter of Belus, king of Tyre. So they fled, fled across the sea from, from Tyre. And Alyssa became the first queen of Carthage, and she took on the title of Queen Dido. Dido is, is a mystery name, and it means the same as the Greek word Sophia. It's the personification of wisdom. Dido is wisdom as a name, you know, so that, that was what she took on as a title. And, um, and when she lost Aeneas, he, he sailed away, leaving her basically a widow. So she became known as Widow Dido. And this was taken up by the Dionysian artificers, who were kind of the predecessors of Freemasons later on as a mystery school. And um, Dionysian artificers refer to Widow Dido in their tradition, and they called themselves the Sons of the Widow, or Sons of Wisdom, basically. Um, now this, this is pointed out um, in The Tempest by Adrian in, in uh, Act 2, Scene 1. He says, a Adrian says, Widow Dido, said you, you make me study of that. She was of Carthage, not of Tunis. And Gonzalo replies, this Tunis, sir, was Carthage. And Adrian says, Carthage? Gonzalo replies, I assure you, Carthage. So there's a quibble on Carthage or Tunis and so on, but they're still alluding to the same idea of widow Dido. You know, she's the queen um, that Aeneas married, all, all part of the mystery tradition. And of course, this is connected with... with uh, Alonso's daughter, who'd just been married there. Then Naples. The original name was Neapolis. It was founded in the 6th century BC by the Ionian Greek colonists of Cumae, known as Chalcidians. It was built on an ancient site called Parthenope on the western slope of Mount Vesuvius, a short distance southeast of Cumae. So nowadays, we think of a more dangerous situation, really. But, but in those days, Kumai was pretty dangerous, too, very volcanic. <clears throat> and Kumai, the mother town of Neapolis, was founded in the 11th century BC on the steep hill of Mount Gaurus, G-A-U-R-U-S. It was the most ancient of all the Greek colonies in Italy and Sicily. It was the residence of the earliest oracular Sibyl. Sibyl means prophetess. That, that's where she resided. And it was also home to the great Dionysian mystery school that flourished there in underground caverns and hidden valleys of the mountain. There's not much left of it, but there is something left, and they're still excavating um, many of the remains. Sarah and I have been there, had a brief visit once. Um, and what, what, has, what has been found so far is, quite, is very interesting in itself, you know, to see... Um, I don't know how much was visible in Shakespeare's time. But anyway, the, the tradition is there um, about it. And then you've got Milan. Well, how does Milan feature in this? Well, Milan was known as to Romans as Mediolanum, and they called it the New Athens. It became a very famous centre of culture and learning in Roman times, taking over from the old Athens, as it were. And... Um, one of the traditions about it, it was founded with a bull sacrifice and dedicated to the goddess Minerva. That's, that's the Greek Pallas Athena, whose name means the spear shaker. So you see how important was this to Shakespeare, this whole thing. And she was known as the goddess of wisdom. And in 286, Diocletian moved the capital of the Western Roman Empire from Rome to Mediolanum. And from then on, it became the residence of the Roman emperors of the Western Empire until A.D. 402. 
and then the, the, I think there were Gothic invasions then they had to move out. Um, but it was that important to them. Um, and then in terms of Christianity and the Christian mysteries and the, and the later esoteric blossoming of it in the Renaissance times, also important because it was from Milan that Emperor Constantine issued the Edict of Milan in 313 AD, which granted tolerance to all religions within the empire, thus paving the way for Christianity to become the dominant religion of the whole empire. So it was, you could say it was the birthplace of Christianity to take off in a very, very major way um, and protected rather than being persecuted. Then it also has a, a very deep Freemasonic connection with the Dionysian artifices, which I won't, won't go into today, but um, it's, it's there. And also the, it's the Renaissance source of special symbol used by the mystery schools, uh, the double A symbol, which you can find as headpieces in the Shakespeare folio and other books by the Rosicrucians of, of Shakespeare's time, uh, the AA symbolism. And it it's, was first published, made public, um, in Andres Alciat's um, Emblemata, which was published in Milan at that time. It's a key, key symbol, the double A. Then in the Christian mysteries, you've got the Christian Kabbalah coming into it. But the, the, the fundamental thing about the Christian mysteries is you've got Jesus teaching, the Orphic teaching, really, God is love. So he reinterpreted the whole of the Hebrew and Judaic, 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 Judaic teachings by saying, you know, God is love. That's how you should understand all, all your prophets and so on, and, and, and the Moses Ten Commandments and so on. It, it's actually God is love. Therefore, love God and love each other. This is the great commandment. Um, huge revelation given out. It was already known in the mystery tradition, the Dionysian mystery tradition, and the Tanishas of it, but not understood generally throughout. So Jesus is the one who really brought it out and, and acted it. You know, he, he, he knew it because he was it, he embodied it. Um, well, the things about Jesus are very interesting. Jesus was the one who controlled the storm on the Sea of Galilee. Controlled the tempest and charge, charge him in it. He may have conjured it up to start with, and then he showed how to, how to calm it down and so on. In charge of it. He turned water into wine. He fed the 5,000. In other words, he created food out of virtually nothing. He just had a few loaves and a fish, and he fed 5,000 people from it. You know, magic, the magician. He healed the sick, cast out devils, admonished the scribes and Pharisees, because he wasn't afraid to say, you know, tell people off and be, be stern about it. And he ch even chased the moneylenders and others out of the temple with a whip when it came to that. So all this gentle, gentle Jesus, which most people brought up with, he wasn't just gentle, he was also very rigorous, very severe with those who were not so good in, in their behavior. And he raised the dead to life. And then he forgave his executioners. And he surrendered all his magic. He, he could have done anything, but he surrendered it all, gave himself up to die, to, to be crucified, and, and so on. And, and the key, it's, that forgiveness of his execution is so huge. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They don't know, they don't understand. And um, gave his forgiveness, having surrendered all his powers. We'll see how this links with Prospero again, and what, what, he, he, was, what he did, what he was going through. Uh, to start with, he's severe with the, um, and strict with the men of sin, as they're called, and the drunkards, and so on. But he's not doing them any harm. He's giving them a tough time and taking them eventually through waters where they get purified. And, um, and then at the right moment, uh, which I'll talk about a, a bit later on, uh, at the right moment, he, he's able to stop being the severe judge, but become the compassionate one, give mercy but only at a certain point is he able to do this. Um, anyway, before I go into that in more detail, it's really important this, and people often miss it. 
Um, he says, oh, where are we? This one we got. It's right at the end, right at the end in this, um, the epilogue, last two lines, he says, as you from crimes would pardon be, let your indulgence set me free. So he's asking others to forgive him. Indulgence means forgiveness. But forgive my sins, whatever sins I have, please forgive them and set me free. Well, one of the key words in this, or the key word, is the very last word of the play, which is the word free. And uh, free is from the Sanskrit word, free or pre, which means love. So in other words, to be set free is to come into that state of freedom, which is the state of love, which is mastery or illumination. And in fact, that's how it was used in the mystery schools. Somebody who'd reached that high level of initiation was said to be free. They were the free one. So it became a title. Um, well, the, what, one of the main things about Prospero is he, he cannot do anything without his spirit aerial. So he has his spirit that he's released. And um, Ariel does the work under the commandments of Prospero um, and also does some extra things that Prospero hadn't asked him to do, so he's so <laughs> a highly intelligent spirit. But he's referred to as an airy spirit. Well, airy spirit links you straight away in the Christian mysteries to what's called the Holy Spirit. Because in the Bible, the Holy Spirit that moves upon the face of the waters properly interpreted is the holy breath. It's an airy spirit. It's the breath. The airy spirit is the holy spirit. It's an intelligence, a thought of God, a thought of, a thought of love. And in fact, thought of God, that's where the word angel comes from. It's because angel or ang el means thought of God. It's, it's the spirit, the holy spirit. And in, in, in um, you know, the, the Renaissance tradition that Shakespeare used, um, spirits were often symbolized as birds. So Prosper refers to Ariel as my bird, my chick. And so on. so he's, you know, you can you get an idea, what, 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 what is this? Well, the word, the name itself is borrowed from the, from the Jewish or Hebrew tradition, and it means lion of God. Ariel means lion of God. And it was also once the name of Jerusalem. Jerusalem's called Ariel one time in, in the Jewish tradition. Jerusalem itself, as a word, means the great peace. And the place where it was situated was representing the heart of the whole of Israel. So you've got this link of the lion as a symbol. You know, the um, uh, Leo, the constellation Leo, is said to, to rule the heart. And the um, lion of God, and that's Jerusalem, that's the heart, heart of Israel. And, and that's the great peace. And it's the heart is the center of, of love. Another meaning of Ariel in the Hebrew tradition is hearth of God. The hearth of God, which also means heart. The hearth was in the heart of the home on which you had, your sacred fire was burning. But Ben Johnson's very interesting because he often made comments about some of uh, these things. And... Um, so he, he created a mask called the Fortunate Isles and their Union. And in this he renames Ariel as Joffiel, but he's very clearly making a parody of the Tempest um, in this story. And um, he, so he renames Ariel as Joffiel. Well, Joff, it's interesting, Joffiel is also a name from the Hebrew tradition, and it's the archangel of grace, or goodwill, compassion, mercy. That's how it's used in the Hebrew tradition. So again, you got this idea of that love given out as grace, goodwill, compassion, mercy, forgiveness. Um, and Ben Johnson goes on to describe Joffiel as the intelligence of Jupiter's sphere and an arrow shot by love. Well, that's, that's Cupid, that's Eros coming in again with his arrows of love shooting out. So this is spirit and arrow, spirit of that love, whose function is to be merciful, spirit of mercy. And he uses Jupiter, because Jupiter is one of the planetary symbols used in the Kabbalah on the Tree of Life to represent grace and mercy and 
compassion. And it's also known as the right hand of God. The right hand of God is mercy, compassion. The left hand of God is judgment or justice. And the two have to be applied in balance. Now this is a key to this play and other plays too. You can't have the one without the other. And in fact, the, the, the left-hand one, the, the justice and judgment, is associated with what's become known now as the law of karma. It used to be known as the law of cause and effect. We're all caught up in that. The whole universe is ruled by that cause and effect. Um, and in the East, it's called karma, the law of karma. What you sow, you will reap. What you sow, you will reap. Um, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, and so on like that. It's the Hebrew in Old Testament that we give. Um, but balancing that is the mercy side, and the law there is called the law of redemption. But the law of redemption cannot operate until those who are caught up, which is all of us, are caught up in the law of karma, reach a certain state. And this is repentance. Acknowledging we have made a mistake, we have sinned, made a mistake, maybe a serious one or maybe a slight one, and we acknowledge that was bad and we're going to try and do better. And then mercy can operate immediately. Can't operate until somebody is in that state able to receive the mercy. They got to, because mercy will redeem, it will transform the whole situation to another into something else, you know, raise, raise the situation to another level. Um, so it's, it starts off being hinted at in the Old Testament, in Proverbs, for instance, Proverbs 28, verse 13, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Absolutely key, that. And then in the New Testament, St. James in his letter says, um, for judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy, but mercy triumphs over judgment. It has to be that repentance. And then in Luke, Gospel of Luke, um, chapter 6, verses 36, 37, says, Jesus says, be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. So we have to reach the, the state of repentance, and then the mercy operates. And that's exactly what we can find with Prospero and everybody on the island. Um, and they're taken through, you can see how they're taken through initiations, like in the mystery school, that test them, test them, test them, until eventually they're purified in the sea, cleansed in the sea, and they're they are repentant. But it's said very slightly, and most people miss it. Most directors miss this key thing. And it comes in Act 5, Scene 1, in the first 32 lines. I've just taken out a few bits of it. Prospero says to Ariel, Say, my spirit, how fares the king and his followers? And Ariel replies, Confined together in the same fashion as you gave in charge, just as you left them. All prisoners, sir, in the lime grove which, which weather fends your cell. They cannot budge till your release. The king, his brother and yours abide all three distracted, and the remainder mourning over them, brimful of sorrow and dismay. But chiefly him you term, sir, the good old Lord Gonzalo. His tears run down his beard, like winter's drops from eaves of reeds. Your charm so strongly works them that if you now beheld him, beheld them, your affections would become tender. And Prospero says, Does that think so, spirit? Ariel said, Mine would, sir, were I human. And Prospero replies, Though with their high wrongs I'm struck to the quick, yet with my nobler reason, against my fury, do I take part. The rarer action is in virtue than in vengeance. They being penitent, the sole drift of my purpose doth extend not a frown further. Go release them, Ariel. My charms are break, their senses are restored, and they shall be themselves. 
absolutely key, that key mm -hmm. moment. And, and Prospero says it, they being penitent. So they, they've reached a point, he's, and Ariel's clearly reported that to Prospero, and he realises, yes, they really are at a point where they can be shown mercy. And they, in other words, that somebody shown mercy is given a second chance to live a better life. Whether they will or not, it's up to them. But they're given a second chance because they've seen they've done something wrong and they're sorry for it. And, and they're, they're, they're penitent. Absolutely key. But so many people and directors and so on miss that. Um, so important. And so one can see Prospero really as, as, as the mage. He knows what he's doing. And he acts as the judge first. He starts off as the judge. So he's got his prisoners. You know, he's, he's a judge over them. Um, are they going to be penitent or are they not? They become penitent, so then he becomes what's called the king, whose, whose virtue is mercy. The quality of the king is, is mercy. So he then becomes the king who give, gives them the mercy. And also at the same time, he's the hierophant Harf, who's initiating everybody who's, who's on that island and raising them up to a higher level, um, eventually towards illumination. In other words, he acts as a judge, a king, and a hierophant, which is what is associated with Hermes Trismegistus. Sometimes it's referred to, for Hermes, as a philosopher, king, and priest, but it's the same thing. The philosopher is the judge. The, um, the, 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 the king is the one who gives the mercy, and the priest is the hierophant. So it's all, all these three. And then in addition, you've got um, he's, he's initiating people on all the different levels that alchemy recognises that, that human beings are at. We're a whole mixture of people at different levels of, of um, development, you could say. And, um, and this, this, was rec this was formulated by the alchemists into four main levels, which they symbolise as earth, water, air, fire. Um, exactly as the process of life goes, desire, thought, action, um, impulse, desire, thought, action, earth, water, air, fire. So, so everything is designed in the universe on, on the same best basis, just like the candle burns. And if you do it well, then you, you have a true flame that produces light. Um, but they applied this to the four levels of human evolution they recognize. The, gross level, the mundane level, the virtuous level, and the exalted level. And the gross level um, took people through a purgation, and then they would be able to then, if they went through that purgation, they could get back into the um, mundane level, really, that most people, thank goodness, are at. Um, live an ordinary, relatively good life, but, but not an initiatory life as yet. Um, and then they would go through the purification level, symbolized by water. And if they become true initiates and say, yes, I, I want to follow a path of love, you know, I want to do good um, and uh, not be selfish and so on like that, then they enter the next degree, the true initiatory degree that's called refinement, um, the virtuous level. And then the, the final level is that of the adept, that's who's exalted, and that's the sub called sublimation in alchemy. Um, and the, the Greeks and the Romans refer, the sages refer to these human beings in those levels. The mortal men become the heroes, who become the demons, who become the gods. So we're going up through these gradations. So I'm going to end this little talk showing these characters on the screen. So that, these are the main characters, Ariel, the Aero Spirit, and Prospero, 
Then you've got Miranda and Ferdinand. Then you've got the good lords, Francisco, Gonzalo, and Adrian. And then the three men of sin, as they're called, Sebastian, Alonso, and Antonio. And then you've got the, um, the servants, basically, the, the Trinculo, the jester, Canavan, who's called salvage. A word akin to savage, but it's not savage, it's salvage. So that's an important description of Canavan. And, um, and you've got Stefano, who's the butler off, off the ship. And then there's the master and the bosun, who feature in the play. Well, these fit into the alchemical series in this way. At the gross level, to start off with in the play, you've got Trinculo, Caliban, and Stefano, who link up together. They behave grossly. They are gross in what they do, and they set out to murder um, murder Prospero and, and um, take Miranda as a sex slave, basically. Um, not very nice, you know, when you think of this, you know, what's been stated here. How, how do you stop that? How do you transform the situation? And then you've got the three lords who ought to know better, a king, king of Naples, um, his brother, and Prospero's brother, who usurped Prospero in the first place. Um, and if they had a chance, they killed they kill Prospero. You know, they tried to kill him before, but he survived, unknown to them. Um, and so they, they're not behaving well. Well, they start off at that gross level. But they, they go through their repentance, so they can get, by the end of the play, then get let, let, raised up to the next level, which is the mundane level, which the good laws are in, Francisco, Gonzalo, and Adrian. So they're there in that, at the start, right, right through, but going through their experiences as such. And, um, and at the very end, I think there's a hint there that they are going to begin their new life when they get home. They're going to maybe start in the virtuous cycle. Um, the virtuous cycle, you've got straight away Miranda's in that right from the beginning, and so is Ferdinand. And those are the two that Prospero tried to bring together, um, hope, hoping for the marriage, and then, then it happens. So there, and that, that marriage is a symbol of, of initiation too, so that's another whole depth to it. And then at the exalted level, um, you've got Prospero, and um, he, he's just uh, some sort of stage there at the exalted, but by doing this, he, he, he raises himself a bit higher in the Duke of Milan, and Ariel, who's a spirit. So Ariel's up in the etheric level. So it's fantastic the way Shakespeare's put, put this together in this, showing amazing pattern of the, all these levels, grouped in virtually in trinities, really, uh, almost a um, fantastic plane. <laughs>